Uh, Colin Craig of SecondStreet.org joins us with, I think, what are catastrophic numbers, really. Welcome to the show, Colin, uh, coming to us from Calgary in the beautiful province of Alberta. Welcome once again, Colin. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark. All right, so on your website, you've put a report, waiting list deaths surge in 2020 to 2021. And uh, this is a brand new report. Government data shows that at least 11,581 patients died on waiting lists in 2021. Now, are we talking nationwide here or are you drilling down provincially? It, that's a nationwide figure. Okay. And just a couple notes that uh, just so your readers are aware of what it represents. That's government data from government bodies that actually track the reasons for why surgeries are canceled. Many governments in Canada just simply don't track why a surgery is canceled, but quite often uh, the government will phone a patient to schedule their surgery or the patient's um, remaining relatives or someone close to the patient will tell the government that the patient's actually passed away. So then that gets entered into the system that the patient no longer needs surgery, a diagnostic scan, an appointment with a specialist and so forth. And it, it does cover uh, certainly cases where a patient dies while waiting for a surgery that could have potentially saved their lives. Uh, but there's also a lot of cases where patients are dying while waiting for surgeries that could have improved their quality of life. So maybe it's a, a hip operation, knee operation, cataract surgery. And, you know, sometimes people seem to dismiss those cases, but I don't think you can. And if you think about it, imagine spending the final year or two of your life stuck in your apartment with chronic pain because you're waiting for your hip to get done or you're walking around with cloudy vision because you're waiting for cataract surgery. So it, it certainly many of these cases, they're going to be troubling uh, real world stories of patients behind these figures. And uh, it's, I think it's certainly troubling. And one thing I would note for your, your listeners and your viewers loud and clear is that these numbers were on the rise before COVID hit. Uh, COVID has made the numbers worse, I believe, but I don't think we can dismiss this as, oh, this is just a COVID problem. This was a problem before COVID hit Canada. Just reading uh, the story fresh off your website, secondstreet.org, new research by Think Tank, secondstreet.org shows at least 11,581 patients. I can't even process that number. Mm -hmm. Patients across Canada died in 2021 while waiting for surgeries, and I can distinctly remember many of these uh, medical officials denying that that was the case. Oh, we don't put people on waiting lists if they need life-saving surgery, waiting for diagnostic scans. So let's uh, not forget all those people who put off getting tests, right? Mm -hmm. Getting a cancer screening done and appointments with specialists, so they didn't get that either. The patient deaths identified ranged from people waiting for potentially life-saving treatment, like heart operations. I cannot believe that they would actually put heart operations on hold because, what, resources were being allocated towards dealing with the COVID pandemic? Have I got that right? Yeah, that, that's happened. And uh, I believe it was the University Health Network in Ontario where they noted it was between 30 and 40 cases where they believed that cardiac patients had passed away because they didn't get their treatment in time. This was uh, earlier on during the pandemic. Um, we've seen anecdotes from different parts of the country where governments have acknowledged that uh, there are patients that are dying for procedures which could have potentially saved their lives. So in, in Nova Scotia, the government noted that there were 51 cases where that happened. And they also noted that in over three quarters of those cases, so the vast majority of them, uh, the patients had waited longer than the target time. So we see the stats coming out. We've heard real world stories. Jerry Dunham, a patient in Alberta, he was waiting for pacemaker surgery. And um, the system said, no, we, we can't do it. We're busy focusing on COVID. We can't, can't have you in the hospital. And so, you know, sadly, he ended up passing away. His, just, his heart gave up before he had that surgery. And he Unbelievable. Left young kids. I mean, we raised issues on Saga 960. I interviewed people who mm -hmm. said the government has postponed, had a lady on, a couple. They were fit to be tied. They were mm -hmm. terrified that he was going to die on a waiting list. We raised the issue on the show. 
mm-hmm. and all of a sudden uh, some bureaucrats bureaucrats uh you know like uh it lit a fire under their ass oh yeah well we're no no we're, we're gonna we're gonna deal with this issue you know but yeah. <laughs> sadly for those who didn't get the uh, media attention i suppose they just uh were ignored and died on waiting lists i mean this that- is criminal it, Absolutely it's, criminal. It's brutal. It's brutal. And we owe it to ourselves as a nation to proceed with health reform. We have been talking about this for decades now, decades and decades. And the solution, and I'll put that in air quotes, from politicians across the political spectrum has been, well, let's just spend more money, spend more money. And lo and behold, governments have dumped tons and tons of money into the healthcare system, well above the inflation rate. And uh, the end result is that we're still talking about the problem. The way to fix it is through structural reform, many different options. And we can preserve this thing that Canadians hold dearly, myself included. I think it's important that we have universal health care. Everyone's covered. Uh, Whether you're rich or you're poor, you have that option. Um, We can preserve that while moving forward with health reform that can start to reduce patient suffering. And as long as we don't move forward with those types of options then we're going to keep hearing stories like this we're we as an organization will keep digging up these numbers and i'll just note for your your listeners and viewers that we've posted all these government responses online so people can go on 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 our website see all the letters from governments handing over this data if they want to see it for themselves and obviously you know not everybody can afford to try and seek help elsewhere and other countries were dealing with their own medical crunch. I suppose if you were well healed, you could try to get uh, health care uh, in the United States or, you know, even so-called third world countries you know, may, or maybe European countries, you know, Switzerland or whatever, pay, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Here we have this socialized system. Everybody's forced to pay into it told that, yeah, we've got the best in the world. Well, obviously we don't. And uh, somehow we've had literally thousands of people die. Data from health bodies, just quoting from the report that provided surgical waiting list numbers over the last three years shows an 11.7% increase in waiting list deaths since 2018, 2019. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you said, this is the government's own numbers. So, These are the government's numbers. It's not us making I anything mean, up. Like, so. why hasn't this become a thing uh, discussed? Say, I mean, this this should lead to questions in the House of Commons. This this should be uh, debated about. This should be discussed in legislatures and provinces, right from one end of the country to the other. And it's not being, to my knowledge, it has uh, largely been swept under the rug. I mean, who is being held accountable for these terrible decisions? I, I don't think very many people are being held accountable for them. And and you're right. These questions should be asked more frequently. This The simple question, if I was a health critic in any provincial legislature or in the, the uh, House of Commons in Ottawa, I would stand up and ask the Minister of Health, how many patients died during the previous year because they had to wait too long for surgery or some kind of a procedure from the government. And in most cases, we know what's going to happen. Health ministers are going to stand up and they're going to provide a non-answer. They're not going to address it. But shouldn't that be a story that ministers don't know? Isn't that an important thing to know? If you're the health minister and you're in charge of the healthcare system and a patient dies because they do not receive the surgery they need in time, isn't that really important to know? And as I mentioned right at the beginning, many health bodies in Canada simply don't track this. And I would think that if you're a minister of health and you're really concerned about providing the best quality care for patients, then you should want to know that question. You should want to be asking all these health bodies that you're funding each year, how many patients did we let down? How many families did we let down? And from there, grow the question, how many patients lived in chronic pain because we didn't get them surgery in time? How many patients developed complications because they spent a year on painkillers because we didn't get them surgery in time? Those are the tough questions that I think opposition 
uh, politicians should be asking. And I would argue ministers of health and people that are running governments should want to know that information as well. And how many politicians got special treatment because of who they were, or the connections they had? Um, you we, know, obviously, we know that happens. People in the system uh, don't have a problem <laughs> quite often yeah, getting... Yeah, funny that. Food. Maybe if they had to suffer the same way that other Canadians did, then this wouldn't yeah. be happening. You know, how many of these uh, politicians, you know, if a family member needed life-saving surgery, I somehow doubt that they'd end up at the back of the line. You know, they're going to get the care they need. Uh, you know, a phone call goes out to a certain doctor, a certain clinic, you know, a hospital, some bureaucrat somewhere. Oh, yes, absolutely. We'll get right on that. And you move to, this, you move to the head of the line. No yeah. questions asked. Meantime, other people die. This is disgusting. It, Absolutely disgusting, Colin. Oh, it, it's, and it really pisses it's me off. We, we've talked to patients who have had to say goodbye to loved ones because of this. The waiting lists are too long. Or they're worried themselves that they're going to pass away before it's their turn for surgery. Uh, and I would stress again, you know, it's not just people dying. It's chronic pain. You know, I come back to this question. Would you want to live your final life, your final year of your life, in chronic pain, stuck in your apartment, you can't go see your friends anymore, you can't go for coffee, you can't cuddle your grandkids because your, your, your hip pain is too sore and it, you know, they bounce up against you and it's too hard. Those are the types of things that we've been hearing. We can't yeah. dismiss that. And, and we have to remember that governments, in many cases in this country, they do not give patients really a choice. You either use our government system or you have to leave the province or the country and go somewhere else and pay for it. And that, that's, not, that's not choice. God help that's you if you're not vaxxed, because then you, you're denied service. And then on top of it all, you look at the exploding opiate numbers, overdoses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it starts to make sense, doesn't it? As people languish on waiting lists, suffering from chronic pain, hip pain, or whatever mm -hmm. pain that uh, is associated with uh, their uh, ailment. And guess what? It's awfully easy to start abusing opiates, fentanyl, and all mm -hmm. these other uh, treat uh, you know, pain-killing ailments that, if they are abused, uh, can lead to fatalities. And so, what do you see? You see a massive abuse. You see people uh, dying, overdosing mm -hmm. on these yeah. uh, opiates, and it's it's a result. I suspect, at least part of it, as a result of people not being able to get the treatment they need. I, I think that's that's part of it too. Yeah, it's uh, you you end up with problems with opiates. You end up with, as I mentioned earlier, health complications. We we heard talk to a nurse who did a lot of research into this this whole issue of patient suffering, and she described one of the patients that she talked to, and the gentleman had to wait a, a year or so for it was either hip operation, knee operation. During that period, he was prescribed uh, painkillers. So he took them just before his time for surgery. So he spent a whole year of his life waiting for the surgery. They do pre-diagnostic uh, testing and that to make sure he's fit for surgery. And they say, oh, can't operate on you. Sorry, your liver is damaged because you've been on these, these painkillers for so long. So there's all kinds of stories like that out there. And as a nation, we, need, we owe it to ourselves, to our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors, to start moving forward with health reform. And it's, it's not even that we're going to have to experiment. There know. are so this many is... countries on this planet that have universal health care. They're providing better results than what Canada is. We can copy what they've done, learn from their mistakes, and start ultimately improving. Um, yeah, but what do we get instead, though, Colin? It's... We get the fear-mongering, right, from the left, who yeah. starts saying, well, no, we can't. Uh, you, you just want to privatize it all. You want to have credit card you know, U.S. style yeah. healthcare, and so right away it shuts down any further debate, right? Because the bought-off media then sides with the lefties and, you know, demonizes any discussion around the use of, you know, private services, even though we have them here any, anyway, mm -hmm. don't we? But um, we do, yeah. yeah. It's it's a, it's a horrific death toll, and uh, you know it doesn't surprise me that the media has largely uh, been yawning their way through this story. I hope that they see fit to cover it. I hope they see fit to ask our elected officials, the prime minister, health ministers, about these numbers. You've obviously done stellar work. Good for you for doing it. All you've done, uh, and it's, it's, you know, 
I'm not minimizing, but you have used available sources and mm -hmm. uh, sources that cannot be denied. I mean, well, I mean, unless, of course, the government itself is glossing over the real numbers as being even worse than, than these. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's tragic, and uh, certainly our hearts have to go out to all the family members who lost loved ones during this period. Good for you for doing all this work, Colin. Th thank you, Mark. Thank you for drawing attention to this, too. I appreciate the chance to talk to you and uh, reach reach your listeners and your viewers and let them know about this, because it's important. The only way this is going to change is if more people start talking about it. That's the only How do people support uh, your organization? They can uh, go to our website, which is secondstreet.org. Uh, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. You can follow our work there and uh, sign up for email updates if you'd really like uh, to receive uh, content that way. All right. Colin Craig, secondstreet.org. And um, you can find out more about their uh, organization, as, as you just heard there, secondstreet.org, secondstreet.org. You can read the details about that report and uh, support that organization if you can. Uh, thank you. Uh, i got to take a quick commercial break. Back with more on Newstalk, Saga 960, and the Mark Petrano Show. After.